Brilliant. Thank you, Glyn, for bringing our Bible readings this morning. Good morning from me. Lovely to be with you this morning. Uh, apologies for the slightly hectic start, but we're ready uh, and rolling now, which is brilliant. Do keep your Bibles open if you can. If you flick back to the Ephesians passage on page 1177, that would be a great help. I'm going to uh, pray and ask for God's help as we look at his word. Father God, thank you that you do not leave us on our own, but that you give us your spirit and you speak to us through your word. Father, we humbly ask that you do that today as we look at these really important words from Ephesians chapter 6. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when you came in, you were given, hopefully, a handout for our sermon this morning, which should help you follow through what we're hoping to go through today. I'm hoping that'll be a blessing for you. Now, interestingly, yeah, uh, in the UK, around one in four people, 25%, say there is definitely no God. Okay? A quarter of all people are atheists, if you like, say there is definitely no God. Compare that to, say, Kenya, where there is much greater levels of poverty. It's only 2% of people say there is definitely no God. Quite a difference, isn't there, between Kenya and the UK. And so what I want us to think about this morning is that the devil works in different ways in different places. I think here in the UK and in the so-called developed West, I think the devil's biggest trick is to convince people that he doesn't exist and that God's not real. So we don't need to worry. Ah, oh, I'm not really here. God's not really here. You've got nothing to fear. Whereas in more developing countries, for example, where extreme poverty is much more prevalent, and that's not to say that there isn't poverty and difficulty in this country, but in places like Kenya, I think the devil's biggest trick is to say, I'm more powerful. Watch out. Your God can't do anything. Right, so the devil works in different ways in different places. And in our passage today in Ephesians chapter 6, we see talk of a spiritual battle, don't we? And that can often be confusing for us to think about, especially in our culture. But if you have a look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, what is the first word of our passage this week? Finally. Finally. Brilliant, okay. So this is what Paul wants to stress as he draws this book of Ephesians to a close. Okay, um, actually, if I just uh, click on, there we go. Through our sermon series, all the way through the book of Ephesians, we've been uh, hearing how we are one in Christ as God's people. And there is a call for us to become who we are, to be those people who are one in Christ. This is a kind of last chunk of instructions to help us with that. And it's really helpful. And then this passage also shows uh, why it's hard to do church well. Why it's hard to do our relationships in the home well. Why it's hard to do uh, our work well. Because we're in a spiritual battle. So, have a look at verse 10. We'll just reread from verse 10. Oh, uh, first thing to think about is as we are thinking about being who we are, God's people, one in Christ, the first thing we're looking at is that we need to be strong. So have a look at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. So the first instruction for us is to be strong. But it's not the kind of strength that you get from protein shakes and going to the gym five times a week. No, it's much greater strength than that. Do you see in verse 10? It's be strong in the Lord. So flip back in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1 and let's just think about that uh, strength of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 18, uh, page 1173. 
I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at uh, the right hand, at his right hand in the heavenly realms. It's that power that raised Jesus from the dead that we are to be strong in. It's this strength that enables us to take a stand against the devil's schemes. And after that, to still be standing. Now, often at Heroes and Impact on a Thursday night, we play elimination type games where everybody's in to start with and gradually as the game progresses, more and more people get out until you've got one left standing at the end. Um, if you're not fortunate enough to come along to Heroes and Impact, think about musical statues. If you stop and then you get out, don't you, if you wiggle? and eventually you've got one left and they probably get a bag of parabo. Nice. This is not what we're talking about here with kind of eliminating people until you've just got one person standing. No. We don't just want one person in the church family left standing in the space of the devil's attacks. This is for us corporately as a church. We all need to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power so that we can stand against his schemes and after we've done that, to still stand. It's a brilliant picture of victory, isn't it? I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still standing. There's a song there, but that's it. <laughs> I'm not going to sing that. This passage tells of the need to stand against the devil's schemes, right? So let's just get a little bit of a grounding in the devil's work today. So that we don't overplay his power, but also so that we don't forget we are in a battle. So, uh, the devil today... The Ephesians, I think, had grown up in a, in a really superstitious culture, and so they were frightened of Satan, the devil, different name for the same thing, and his demonic powers. And so Paul wanted his readers, then and now, to understand spiritual warfare from a biblical perspective. So just quickly, five principles about the devil's work today, okay? Firstly, we need to be clear that Satan is real. He is a real and vicious enemy of God and his people. Don't believe the devil's lies in our country. He is real. A rebellious angel hurled down from heaven and filled with fury because he knows his time is short and who wants to lead the whole world astray. Those are some thoughts from Revelation chapter 12. But remember, Christian, the reason the Son of God appeared is to destroy the devil's work. That's 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. So he's real. Secondly, Satan tempts us to doubt God's word. And that has always been his way from the beginning. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden, what was it that the serpent said to Adam and Eve? Did God really say? Did he really mean that? Does he really want to withhold that wonderful thing from you? kind of God is that? Did he really say? We need to remember that the devil is the father of lies. John chapter 8, verse 44. Then, uh, thinking about the Old Testament, the Old Testament records how God rescued Israel from bondage to pagan fear. That's why we had our reading from Deuteronomy chapter 18. God's people were to be different and distinctive to how all the people around them lived. They weren't to be doing those occult practices because actually the surrounding nations were terrified by demonic spirits. God's people were to be different, recognising that God's power was greater and that God was with them. We see that and uh, we see lots of passages warning about messing with evil in the Old Testament. So Saul, uh, that king was reprimanded, wasn't he, for trying to raise the spirit of Samuel with that medium at Endor, if you know that, that story. But then in the New Testament, we see that Christ came to defeat the devil. He shows absolute power over the devil, doesn't he? So that uh, the people were amazed, we read in Mark's Gospel, chapter one, a new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. 
We see in the Lord's Prayer, don't we? Deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one. Meaning the same thing. We see how the devil, we see how Jesus defeated the devil when he was tempted in the desert. Where again, the devil lied to the Lord Jesus, but his answer was always scripture. And then there's that great example in Mark 5, isn't there, where Jesus healed the man who, uh, um, Legion, who was demon possessed with all those hundreds of demons. The Lord, in a word, heals him, restores him, and puts him in his right mind. Jesus defeats the devil. And then in Ephesians, we're going to see that Christ's conquest of Satan is displayed in the local church. Amongst us, we have a part to play. So, uh, what are we to do? To be the people we are, we are to be strong in the Lord and we're to stand firm. And this is where we get to those really famous references to the armour of God. And forgive me, I'm not going to get dressed up today. Okay? But what is it all about? Let's have a look at verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, contrary to what we might expect, when we look carefully at these pieces of armour, we soon realise that truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation and the word of God are not virtuous actions that we are to start doing. That's interesting, isn't it? Paul isn't urging us to be good. Rather, they're, they're ways of describing the impact of the gospel. The full armour of God, which our champion and commander, Jesus, if you like, wore in battle, to summarise, it's simply faith in the gospel, which is what the devil wants us to abandon. Okay? The armour of God which Jesus wore is illustrated here with the complete kit of the heavily armoured Roman foot soldier. And it picks up loads of uh, links that we're not going to look at in detail, but loads of links back to the book of Isaiah, where the Lord, Yahweh, is described as a warrior who fights for his people. For us, we must be clear, there is no need to fear Satan while we remain dressed in this armour. Because Jesus used this armour, and he has risen from the dead, and is now in glory in heaven, proving it's effective. So let's look briefly at each bit of kit. Firstly, we have the belt of truth. We wear the belt of truth when, like a Roman soldier wearing a protective apron or belt, we keep trusting in the truth of the gospel. There's loads of references to truth in the book of Ephesians. The truth that Jesus lived in righteousness and um, faithfulness for our salvation. And it's a huge contrast to the devil who's the father of lies. Jesus is the truth, the devil is the father of lies. Then we've got the breastplate of righteousness. Just as a breastplate covers a soldier, so in the gospel we learn that Jesus' righteousness covers us. Jesus lived a life of perfect righteousness for us. So we wear this breastplate of righteousness when we keep trusting the gospel that Jesus' righteousness is what qualifies us for heaven. And it protects us from Satan's lies and condemnation when he tempts us to think, you're not good enough. How could God love you? You're a rubbish Christian. Look how you're living your life. Look what's happened to you. When was the last time you prayed for so and so? When was the last time you gave him a ring? When was the last time you visited this book? You're rubbish. God can't really love you. No. When we wear the breastplate of righteousness, we remember that we are saved because of his righteousness, not because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. It's brilliant. Um, the word is imputed. We have Jesus' righteousness imputed, given to us. Then, next one, this is a bit harder to get your head around. Your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, in verse 15. You see, the message of the gospel brings peace 
between us and God and between us and each other. Gospel shoes, if you like, not only represent what we've become in Christ, but also the message that we can now share with the world, the message of peace with God and with one another through Jesus. We are wearing these sandals of peace when, like troops prepared for battle, we so trust in the peace that Jesus secured for us on the cross that we then proclaim to others. Then we've got the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. What an amazing picture that is. We will face a barrage of attacks on our holiness, on our prayer life, on our Bible reading, on our relationship with other Christians, and in our evangelism. This is the work of Satan and his fiery arrows. Faith is the shield with which we not only resist, but also extinguish these arrows. The, the effect of these fiery arrows is rendered powerless by faith. But remember, this faith is a gift from God. So if you want to flick back to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, on page 1174, it says, For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This armour is not about us and what we do, it's about Jesus and the victory he has won. We're taking up the shield of faith when, like Roman soldiers, protected by full-length shields from arrows tipped with flaming pitch, we're trusting the gospel of Jesus to shield us from Satan's lies. And interestingly, uh, Roman soldiers, when they use the shields, they'd all kind of be standing together, wouldn't they, with the shields? So you'd have all these full-length shields, and they'd kind of make a tortoise show with them. So they were impenetrable. That's a difficult word to say when preaching. And so it kind of shows the corporate nature of us standing firm together, doesn't it? All holding our shields, defending against the devil's lies. So that's the shield of faith. Remember, that's, that faith is a gift from God. And then we've got the helmet of salvation. Ooh, in verse 17, Isaiah promised a saviour who would wear the helmet of salvation on his head. It's Isaiah 59. Jesus is this saviour. And like troops protected by bronze helmets, we are taking the helmet of salvation when we're trusting that Jesus is our saviour and our judge. The fact that there needs to be a helmet shows that Satan will attack our source of assurance and salvation. But Jesus has done all we need. He is our salvation. We are eternally secure. That's a massive help and encouragement, isn't it? And then, uh, finally, with these uh, things, we've got the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God in verse 17. All of the others so far have kind of been defensive, haven't they? But a sword is offensive. You can attack with a sword, and the word of God is the only offensive weapon we need in this section. Remember how the Lord Jesus defeated the devil uh, when he was in the desert? By using the word of the uh, scripture, wasn't it? He repeated scripture back to the devil. And look at this the way this is worded here. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You know, people often want to kind of drive a wedge between a spirit-filled church and a word-filled church. But that's crazy, because you can't have one without the other, because the spirit-filled church must be a word-filled church, because the sword of the spirit is the word of God. They go together. So we are like a Roman soldier wielding his sword when we trust in God's word that guarantees our salvation. Not in what we do, not in what we bring to the table, not in how often we come to church or how often we pray or any of those good things. So to be the people we've been called to be, one in Christ for God's glory, we must be strong in God's strength and we must stand firm, putting on the full armour of God. But there is actually one more offensive weapon, as in for attack. Did you spot it in verse 18? We are to pray. 
Look at verse 18. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Prayer, along with God's word, the sword of the Spirit, are our other great uh, weapons. Prayer is given significant time here, isn't it? It's given three verses, which is more than the other uh, pieces of armour. And notice how we're to pray, verse 18. We're to pray on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers, to always keep on praying for all of God's people. That's what praying in the Spirit looks like. We're to pray for God's people, in verse 18, to be effective in our wearing of the armour, so that we might stand firm in the face of all the devil's real attacks. Whether that's in the subtlety of the devil's work in the West or in the outright blatant evil of spiritual forces in, say, Africa. So in other words, we're to pray for the health of the church. We're to pray for one another. And in verses 19 to 20, we're to pray that we'd be great witnesses, clearly sharing the gospel with those we meet. So we're to pray for the health of the church and the growth of the church. Do you see that from those three verses? So, as we draw things to a close, forget the percentage of people who do or don't believe in God. The devil is real. Jesus is real. His resurrection is real, and so is the, founder, the salvation found in him. For those of us trusting in Jesus, we must be strong in the Lord, stand firm by wearing the armour of God, and remember that's code for having faith in Jesus, and we must pray. Pray for our health and our growth as a church. These are the things Paul wanted to stress at the end of his letter. And just a, a, a practical bit of detail. Please don't worry if you go out in the morning. Oh, I forgot on my breastplate. Or, oh, I'm not sure I've got my helmet. Or, oh, my sandals aren't in the right place. It's not that. We wear the armour of God when we trust in Jesus. And he wore that armour fully for us in defeating the devil. So our security is in him. Don't get caught up in the detail of all the, the little bits. Okay? But remember too, we are to expect suffering and persecution as a Christian. That doesn't mean we're failing in our spiritual battle. Jesus said to his followers, If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Right? John chapter 15 verse 20. Spiritual victory is not being freed from suffering, but it's maintaining faith in the gospel despite it. So we too can stand firm in the faith if we wear the armour we've been given. We can stand firm and amazingly, by God's grace, still stand. Now, if you're not a Christian yet, or you're weighing things up, I do want you this morning to consider the reality of the devil's work. Because we can't stand in, stand against him on our own. So look to Jesus. Because he has defeated the devil. But if the Lord Jesus has defeated the devil, why is it still a battle? Well, let me use this illustration to help. Remember, you might not remember. Think of the D-Day landing on the 6th of June. 1944. D-Day. Right, that was a decisive victory, wasn't it, on the Western Front in World War II. Although the Allied troops had to keep fighting at the Nazis all the way back to Berlin until they surrendered on the 5th of May 1945, ultimate victory was no longer in doubt because of what happened at D-Day. Put your trust in Jesus who has defeated the devil, and he will help you stand against him today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that Jesus is stronger. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we need not fear. Thank you that your perfect love drives out fear. 
Father, keep us conscious that we are in a spiritual battle. Help us, Lord, to wear the armour of God as we express our faith in the Lord Jesus. Father, please help us as a church to stand firm, to look out for one another. Help us, Lord, to be healthy in that. And Father, we seek the growth of your church and others put their trust in the Lord Jesus, our Saviour, our Captain, our Commander, our Lord and our Friend. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.